Back in August of 2018, the American Psychological Association published some guidelines aimed at helping psychologists work with boys and men. Although initially it did not receive a lot of attention, an article covering it, as well as a post on Twitter, caused the issue to gain a lot of attention. The article, along with the actual guidelines, made a number of key points. They described the state of men's society, noting that men commit 90% of homicides in the United States and represent 77% of homicide victims. They're the demographic group most at risk for being victimized by violent crime. They are 3.5 times more likely than women to die by suicide, and their life expectancy is 4.9 years shorter than women's. Boys are far more likely to be diagnosed with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder than girls, and they face harsher punishments in school, especially boys of color. It also claims that the main thrust of the subsequent research is that traditional masculinity, marked by stoicism, competitiveness, dominance, and aggression, is, on the whole, harmful. Men socialized in this way are less likely to engage in healthy behaviors. According to the APA's guidelines, masculine ideology can be thought of as a particular constellation of standards that have held sway over large segments of the population, including anti-femininity, achievement, eschewal of the appearance of weakness, and adventure, risk, and violence. Part of the point seems to be that the privileges that boys and men get from society need to be balanced off with some of the harms that they are experiencing. For example, Traditional masculinity seems to be linked with men being less likely to get preventative health care, more likely to engage in risky behaviors, and less likely to seek mental health services. It can also lead to greater gender conflict, homophobia, bullying, and sexual harassment. The article also has a section called Supporting the Positive, where it notes that it's also important to encourage pro-social aspects of masculinity. In certain circumstances, traits like stoicism and self-sacrifice can be absolutely crucial. Such could be seen as a step in the right direction. According to an article by NBC News, this is the first time in its 127-year history that the APA has issued guidelines to help psychologists specifically address the issues of men and boys. Yet many reactions were very critical. For example, Ben Shapiro published an article on the Daily Wire that says the APA is engaging in politics rather than science. This alleged conflation of science and politics has happened elsewhere, with regards to pedophilia and gender dysphoria, both of which, according to Shapiro, had zero scientific evidence backing them. By listing these examples, Shapiro establishes what appears to be a broader social trend which reflects a corrupt relationship between science and politics. It also provides the general lens through which we can interpret the APA's guidelines. This highlights the fact that events don't occur in isolation. Rather, they unfold within a particular social and historical context. Moreover, the contextual factors that are brought up can influence how one interprets the individual events at hand. This is where things can become controversial. While Shapiro mentions instances which he believes reflect science being corrupted and moving beyond its scope into the realm of politics, others may note how historically there have been unjustified and discriminatory gender roles that have been overly rigid and which need to be addressed. These two different narratives, and others like them, can offer some very different perspectives on how one sees the APA's current guidelines. Shapiro also addresses the issue of how the APA portrays traditional masculinity by calling it psychologically harmful and on the whole harmful. He counters this negative portrayal by discussing some good things that traditional masculinity has contributed to society. He also offers his own definition of it, calling it a masculinity geared towards channeling masculine instincts toward building and protecting rather than tearing down. This gives rise to one of the core disagreements that has arisen over the APA's guidelines. What exactly is the definition of traditional masculinity? And what has been its impact? How one answers the first question 
can have a significant impact on how they answer the second. And unfortunately, it seems that those who disagree are often using the same word or phrase in different ways. Shapiro does not miss the significance of this, as he criticizes the APA, claiming that it has to define traditional masculinity in the narrowest, most negative possible terms. He suggests that this redefinition is critical in order for the APA to reach the conclusions that it has. The general point that he makes seems unquestionable, namely, that the definitions one chooses has a large impact on the conclusions that one arrives at. Exactly what definition we should use, however, is likely to be a more controversial matter. There's also the matter of how the APA's general approach is portrayed. Shapiro offers an unflattering description, claiming that their aim is to destroy masculinity in order to destroy discrimination and oppression, feminize men, and indoctrinate boys. This is contrasted with the solution he offers for men who may feel lost and are looking for meaning. Much of their problems, he suggests, are due to a left-wing culture that denigrates men, not a traditional masculinity built on the idea that men were born to defend, protect, and build. Although both he and the APA would agree that men are facing problems, their understanding of what gives rise to these problems differ. Similar to what he did at the start of the article, Shapiro discusses a broader social context in which men exist, such as a left-leaning perspective which paints them in a negative light and blames them for society's problems. He seems to imply that the APA has joined this left-leaning bandwagon which on the whole, is critical towards men. Shapiro doesn't hold back when he closes the article by saying, One thing is certainly true, though. The APA has destroyed itself on the shoals of politics, and there's no reason for honest-thinking people to take its anti-scientific pronouncements seriously simply because they masquerade as scientists while ignoring facts in favor of political correctness. In another article on The Daily Wire, Matt Walsh also offers a critical view of the APA. I think there are three main points that are worth highlighting. The first deals with how the APA's guidelines are portrayed. Walsh sees it as an attack on manhood as a whole, since it places the blame for men's and society's problems on traits which are natural to men. According to him, if stoicism, competitiveness, and aggression are, on the whole, harmful, then manhood itself is harmful. Such, he claims, has led to the medicalization of masculinity, which tells men and boys that there is something wrong with them. He also briefly speculates that the APA is counterproductive. While on one hand, the APA claims that it is a problem that men do not engage in enough psychological care, they also have labeled all men disordered. According to Walsh, pathologizing an entire group is probably not the best way to incentivize them to get help. One final point I'll highlight is the undercutting of the APA's authority. In order for people to accept the APA's guidelines, there needs to be a degree of trust that its conclusions are correct. Walsh aims at discrediting their proposal by encouraging skepticism and independent thinking. He also emphasizes that what they are advancing is a stupid and dangerous ideological opinion that is draped with the outward appearance of medical and scientific authority. Ultimately, it seems he wants to make people aware of this so they can avoid going along with the ideas that the APA proposes. Of course, this type of coverage did not go unanswered. A number of articles sought to address the critics of the APA's guidelines, especially criticisms leveled by conservatives. In one article by Think Progress, a subheading notes that new psychological guidelines for improving the health and safety of boys and men have conservatives outraged. This statement could be interpreted as portraying conservatives in a negative light. After all, who in their right mind would be against the health and safety of boys and men? The article also seems to offer a slightly different take on how the APA addresses the topic of masculinity. It portrays the issue in a somewhat nuanced manner. Whereas Walsh viewed the APA as attacking masculinity in a more general way, Think Progress claims that its recommendations involve dismantling aspects of masculinity. The key word that stands out to me is aspects. This implies that, from their view, it's more about addressing certain components of masculinity, 
not masculinity as a whole. Later on, it notes that there are ways men can be men without conforming to traditional stereotypes of masculinity. The article also discusses what gives rise to masculinity. It counters conservatives who view it as a fundamental biological aspect of men, rather than as something that is socially conditioned and influenced by society. They claim that the APA is simply showing that this socialization harms men in a number of different ways. Rather than waging a war on men and masculinity, the new guidelines simply assess what is going on in society and then connect the dots to make sure men can receive the care they need. This portrays the APA in a radically different light than the previous two articles. It also portrays the organization as balanced and fair by mentioning that they also produced guidelines for women and girls in 2007. What this implies is that the APA isn't coming after men or masculinity. It's simply recognizing that the gender expectations set forth by a patriarchal society can have negative consequences for both men and women. The article closes by critiquing specific responses that conservatives have made against the APA, many of whom believe that men are under attack. For example, Tucker Carlson was portrayed as advancing unsubstantiated claims when making some general points about the problems that men face in society and the direction that society is heading in. The Think Progress article notes that these claims were made without offering any citations. He's also portrayed as ignorant after suggesting that there may be a double standard with the APA's guidelines for men. What would happen, he asks, if a similar set of guidelines emerged for girls, which criticized the traits which made them feel female? The article responds by saying that Carlson was apparently unfamiliar with the APA's previous guidelines for women. The article also criticizes conservatives for saying that masculinity is inherently biological, ignoring the problems that unchecked masculinity can have, basing their views on the Bible, and leveling uninformed criticisms which suggest that they didn't actually read the report. As the article puts it, None of the conservatives who objected to the guidelines actually addressed any of its findings about the barriers to men's mental health, adding later that they're shaking their fist at a straw man. Criticisms against the conservative response to the APA were also made by the Huffington Post, as an article addresses a news segment on Fox and Friends. The story pits a Fox News contributor against the APA, which is identified as the largest professional organization for psychologists in the United States. The article portrays the APA as reliable and fact-based, as it notes that the group presented a number of facts, including that men are more likely to die by suicide, yet less likely to be diagnosed with internalizing disorders like depression. It is also trying to be helpful. The guidelines are meant to help psychologists better help their patients. Yet, in spite of what seems to be something positive, the article notes that it led to a right-wing freakout on Fox and Friends Thursday morning. The Huffington Post claims that the segment mischaracterizes the guidelines when it says that the APA is engaging in political theory rather than science and refer to the guidelines as bigotry. Similarly, it said that the APA recommends psychologists presume that men and boys are suffering from an illness due to their gender. The segment also has exaggerated claims, saying incorrectly that the APA purports that if you are masculine, you're homophobic. If you are masculine, you're suppressing your emotions. You're a bully. Perhaps even more controversially, the woman being interviewed claims that if we didn't have men's courage and aggressiveness and focus and determination, we would be living in caves right now. To counterbalance the claims made on Fox and Friends, the Huffington Post includes some quotes from Jared Skillings, a doctor who is working with the APA. He makes the point that these guidelines are based on evidence, in contrast to the claim made on Fox that it was political theory rather than science. The article closes with him speaking about how the guidelines are meant to recognize the needs of men and help them in a handful of ways. The main point of this seems to be that conservatives are disconnected from what the APA is actually trying to do and have mischaracterized the claims that they have made. Though a lot more could be said on how this topic was covered, these four articles raise some key issues surrounding this topic. To begin, it's probably worth highlighting 
that I did not see any objections to the claim that men face unique challenges in society. This point seems to be universally agreed upon. The differences typically deal with explaining why men have these problems and how we can solve them. This brings us to the second point, the role that masculinity plays in the problems that men in society have. The APA, and those who agreed with them, proposed that traditional masculinity is, at least to some extent, self-destructive. In other words, it harms those who engage in it. Others, however, think that this is misguided, suggesting that other factors play a role in the unfortunate plight of boys and men. Part of this may deal with how we raise them, and part of it may be due to a culture that is becoming increasingly critical towards masculine traits, a sentiment that some would argue is present in the APA's guidelines. A third point of controversy deals specifically with whether masculinity, or as others have put it, traditional masculinity, is good or bad. Some see it as harboring some negative components, implying that the solution is to change or oppose certain aspects of it. Others, however, see masculinity as something which is a positive asset that can be channeled to better society. From their perspective, the masculine traits which men have should be worked with rather than against. A fourth and related point deals with what gives rise to masculine traits. The APA and those who side with it typically view masculinity as something that is socially constructed. This implies that it is produced, for the most part, by the way society is, and that society can alter masculinity by altering itself. Critics, however, see masculine traits as stemming, to a large extent, from innate biological characteristics which tend to be more common in men than women. From this perspective, to criticize masculinity is not simply to level a criticism at how men are taught to behave in society. Rather, it levels a far more direct and personal criticism at who men naturally are. Fifth, there is also the question of how we define masculinity. This is significant because in order for us to assess whether it is good or bad, we must first determine what it is. Different definitions can, in turn, determine whether it is good or bad. Some critics of the APA's guidelines felt that it had defined masculinity in such a way that allowed them to conclude that it is harmful. Another objection was that masculinity was defined in such a way that allowed it to refer to innate characteristics of men. Consequently, and similar to what I noted in the previous point, a critique of masculinity can become a critique of men in a more general sense. This raises a number of important questions. What exactly was the APA critiquing? Were they simply noting that the gender roles assigned to men have some harmful aspects to them? Or are they making a more subtle attack on men as a group? There's also the broader issue that deals with who people are willing to trust. While some seem to laud the APA as the largest organization of professional psychologists in the United States, others viewed it with a great deal of skepticism. Scientific conclusions can often hold an esteemed and authoritative position in society. However, there are many who question whether the allegedly scientific conclusions produced by the APA are true to the discipline. The question of whether political or ideological factors influence the guidelines was raised by a number of people, and this seems to have consistently come from conservatives. Likewise, those who sought to defend the APA from these criticisms typically were left-leaning or progressive news outlets. This reflects an unfortunate blurring between what is a strictly scientific conclusion and what is a blend of science, ideology, and politics. Part of the challenge is that the average person is at the mercy of reporters to formulate their opinion. This highlights the importance of the media of reporting the facts as objectively as possible. As was illustrated through the few articles that I covered here, radically different perspectives can be drawn from reading different sources. One thing I can say from briefly scanning through the APA's guidelines is that there are a lot of citations scattered throughout it. What I cannot say is whether those citations reflect well-done research or if they adequately support the conclusions that the APA arrived at. I'd like to close by emphasizing that this topic consists of a number of different components and people can come down differently on individual points. One might not realize this based on how this topic is covered. After all, from what I saw, 
it typically is the case for certain viewpoints to cluster together. With that said, people don't necessarily need to fall into these predetermined molds. One can have one definition of masculinity, another view on whether masculine traits are due primarily to biological or social causes, another take on whether masculinity has a positive or negative impact on society, and another perspective on how best to address whatever problems uniquely impact boys and men. For me, what is most important is that we clarify what we mean when we use certain words in order to avoid misunderstandings, and that we do our best to substantiate our positions with facts and evidence. By doing this, hopefully people will be able to communicate about controversial topics, find out the precise areas where they agree or disagree, gain a better understanding of why they agree or disagree, and work towards sorting out whatever differences they may have. This requires a bit of work and will likely require that we actively investigate these matters, but that is the cost of living in a world where the reporting on controversial subjects can be fraught with bias. Of course, this is a big subject, and there's no way I could cover all that I'd like, but hopefully what I discussed was at least useful in exposing you to some different ways of thinking about this topic and highlighting some of the key points that people differ on. It also goes to show that readers can develop very different views on what is going on depending on where they get their information from. Anyway, that's it for this video. Thank you for watching, and goodbye.